If you've been thinking about getting in shape or successfully getting in shape or have already gotten in shape, there's a good chance you've heard words tossed around like hypertrophy, anabolism, or even muscle protein synthesis. And all this does play a part when it comes to building muscle, but when you think about building muscle, is it more than just creating those glorious gains? Is there something to it that can impact your health, impact your longevity, and impact your overall quality of life? Well, why don't we dive in and learn a little bit more about the way that building muscle actually works from a scientific standpoint and how that applies to you and your specific journey. So the first thing that we're gonna do is take a zoomed in look at to what a muscle really is. So the first part of a muscle is your muscle belly. Your muscle belly is typically what you think of as the thing that you see when you actually flex. So in your muscle belly, you have fascicles. And in the muscle fascicles, you have muscle fibers. So little bundles of muscle fibers in each one of those fascicles. And inside of those muscle fibers, you have myofibrils. And so your myofibrils are uh, broken up into things called sarcomeres. And then inside of the sarcomeres, there's stuff full of actin and myosin. And so when you start building muscle and you start working out and training and giving your body all the different signals needed for muscle growth, you're gonna start boosting up the amount of myosin that's inside of the different sarcomeres, which are in the microfibrils, which are then in the muscle fibers, which then go into the fascicles, which then go into the muscle belly and everything kind of expands and starts to grow over time. There's a really good analogy for thinking about the way that muscle growth takes place. And think about it like you're going to a mechanic shop. So the parts that you're gonna to need to work with are the protein and the mechanic is something called mTOR. And what mTOR is, is an acronym that's much better than saying the full, the full word, which is mammalian target of rapomyosin. And that's the last time that we'll say that. Now practically applied, when you hit the weight room and you're training really hard, you're giving your body the signals needed to wake up the mechanic, in other words, activate mTOR. Now if things were simple as that, all we'd ever have to do is activate mTOR and we would just endlessly put on more and more and more muscle mass. However, that's not how it works because unfortunately, mTOR has an evil twin called catabolism. Catabolism is just when protein is breaking down, muscle protein is breaking down, and it can happen typically when you're doing things like lifting weights, which seems to be a little bit counterintuitive because your body is constantly in a state of flux between muscle protein synthesis, otherwise known as anabolism, and also muscle protein breakdown known as catabolism or catabolism, however you want to potato potato. However, how this really applies to you is all about the long run. So whether you're anabolic or you're catabolic fluctuating throughout the day, it doesn't really mean much. What really matters is the overall net over the long term. So over days, weeks, and months, if more often than not you are anabolic than you are catabolic, you will be building more lean body mass and more muscle tissue. And so that brings us to the next point, which is, well, how might you go ahead and turn on the anabolic pathways? So this is the part where we wanna talk about how to wake up the mechanic or activate mTOR. So the first thing that you wanna think about is the actual stress that you're placing on your muscles. The first one, of course, is mechanical tension. So mechanical tension is when you are lifting the weight and you're actually overcoming an external force with your skeletal muscle. That's sending signals to it that, hey, we're being activated, we're contracting, we're experiencing the stress that we need to adapt to. So mechanical stress is the first one. The second one is metabolic stress. So the more that you're working out, the more that you gain a pump, and as you're in that gym, you're flooding your, your muscle tissue full of blood and you're changing its pH balance. So as you start to drop the pH balance of your muscle tissue and all the different muscle fibers, you are sending it metabolic signals that, hey, we need to respond to this stress through growth. And the final part is actual muscle damage. So as you're working out and you're breaking down that muscle tissue, it's going to have to repair. And through those repairs, you start to add new mass. So a lot of old school bodybuilders will tell you that the real key to building new muscle tissue is, is the damage. They really overemphasize that part of it. And the problem is they're causing so much catabolic breakdown and not giving themselves enough time to rest and recover in the anabolic phase when you're actually growing and recovering and building new tissue that the net would wind up really not working out in their favor. And a lot of guys can kind of get away with that if they're taking, you can call them adult vitamins, 
We all know what those are and we all know that you don't get to 300 pounds and 4% body fat without taking those adult vitamins. But if you're not taking those, you're gonna to need to have proper things like enough sleep at night, enough rest, enough recovery, maintaining that positive nitrogen balance through having enough protein throughout the day to successfully build and repair muscle tissue. But far and away, the most important things that most people need to think about when trying to build muscle tissue is the mechanical stress part. And so the way that you increase that is by thinking about things like volume and intensity. And so volume is just sets times weight times reps over a given time frame. And so let's say that I'm benching 100 pounds for 10 reps and three sets. That's 3,000 pounds of volume. Now, if that's all I did that week, I'd have 3,000 pounds of volume for that week. And so if the next time or the next week I do 3,500 pounds of volume and then 4,000 pounds of volume and then 45, so on and so forth, you're adding more and more mechanical stress over time that's gonna give your muscles a reason and a signal to grow. So to really put things simply, the more that you're actually increasing your volume and increasing the intensity over time, the more likely you're gonna also be giving those metabolic stress signals where you're altering the pH balance of your muscles in such a way that the metabolic stress and the mechanical stress is really working to your advantage. And if you're not doing so much damage that you can't go back and add more volume and add more metabolic stress, you're gonna continue seeing positive results with muscle growth. So now back to the nutrition part. How much protein do you actually need to get? Well, this is gonna vary a lot from person to person. Things like your age, your gender, the level of intensity, your overall calorie intake all come into play. And just a few things to think about to give you some quick pointers and overviews. Um, you wanna think about the grams of protein per kilogram of lean body mass. So a lot of people make the mistake of thinking, oh, I just need one gram per pound. While that would probably be enough or even more than enough for most people, it's kind of overkill because the more protein that you have, you're gonna be taking away from your carbs, which provide a better fuel source for your training. So if you're not having a good fuel source for your training because you're, you're, doing, you're overdoing it on protein, you're probably gonna have less quality training sessions, which is the whole reason why you need to have protein to begin with to help you recover from session to session. So what you wanna do is think about the law of diminishing returns. Some of a good thing is a good thing, but not that doesn't necessarily mean that more and more and more of that good thing is gonna be a better thing. So back to numbers, if you're looking at around 0.8 to 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of lean body mass, that's probably gonna do you pretty good. Now, the older you are, the more protein you're gonna need, the greater the calorie deficit that you're in, if you're doing fat loss, the greater your protein need is gonna be. Um, if you're using Avatar, the actual software, all that stuff is calculated and factored in for you. Uh, but if not, it's definitely something that you wanna really think about and know that you'll be on the higher end of that if you're older, you're on low calories, uh, and you're working out really hard, or you might be on the lower end of that if you're younger, um, you're in a calorie surplus trying to build muscle, and you're not training super duper hard. So going back to the practical application of all this, do you really need to be pounding down protein uh, in high volumes and high quantities at very specific intervals all throughout the day? Not really. I mean, your daily intake is what matters far and away the most. Do you need to sip BCAs during your workout? No, not really. Is there an anabolic window where immediately after your workout, if you don't have your protein, you're gonna miss out on your gains? No, not really. I mean, all these little things are just the absolute cherry on top. I mean, they might be the invisible cherry on top of the cherry on top of your gains. So you don't wanna to get too caught up in the specifics and just know that your total intake from day to day, really week to week, month to month, as long as you're maintaining that positive nitrogen balance in your body, and again, that nitrogen balance is just a response of having an adequate amount of protein to where Mr. Intor can come in and do his job as the, the muscle mechanic and take the protein and, and put it where it needs to go for muscle protein synthesis. So that way you can get your gains. Anyway, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did and enjoyed it, feel free to leave a thumbs up. That's a very easy thing to do. A comment's a little bit harder, but the comments are also nice because it helps us get feedback on how we can give you more information that helps you out. And if you really want to be cool, that's where the subscribe comes in. And apparently you need to hit this bell thing too to get notifications. Still learning how to use the YouTubes, but uh, it's a good way to get information out there and hopefully you enjoy it. And we can't wait to keep making more videos for you. Until next time, au revoir.